Okay, so I have the Enchiridion. Here we are I'm on passage 16. And uh, we'll see if I can get to that and then 19 as well. In 16 he writes, When you see a man shedding tears and sorrow for a child abroad or dead or for loss of property, beware that you are not carried away by the impression that it is outward ills that make him miserable. Keep this thought by you. What distresses him is not the event, for that does not distress another, but his judgment on the event. Therefore, do not hesitate to sympathize with him so far as words go, and if it so chance, even to groan with him. But take heed that you do not also groan in your inner being. Such a beautiful passage where you see uh, Epictetus being described as someone who in his philosophy is able to sympathize with others who aren't as enlightened as he is. You know, it's like he has this recognition that what troubles us is our thought about things, not things, right? Rather than the, the events of the world, the death, the trauma, all those things that are outside of your control, the rainy days, the, the, your, your position in life, what other people say about you, your reputation, all of these things that are somehow beyond your control. You, loss of property, right? Even death. I mean, it focuses on the things that we really want to say, look, the death of another person. I think all of us, you know, we, we have loved ones that if anything would happen to, I think it would, we'd be so hurt and in, in a, you know, we would be, I think, very upset, right? And I think the sense is that it's the event that is what's made us so upset. Whereas the wisdom of Epictetus would say to us, no, it's actually our thought about it. It's because you have taken under your control what's not under your control. I mean, for him, it would be, look, who are you to judge if the gods saw fit, if divine providence saw fit for this to happen, so be it. It's now already happened right? Uh, I think for him it's, it's good to always begin by aligning with what's already happened. And when something has happened, it, it's, you know, it's, it's that which is beyond your control. I mean, the past, the simplest way to say it, the past is completely beyond your control, right? But he doesn't say, look, don't go up to those people who are grieving over the death of, of a loved one and go, hey, look, buddy, why are you grieving? Don't grieve. It's just your head that's making it feel that way. No, he's recognizing that when a person is grieving, you can go there and even grieve with them, groan with them. But the whole time, deep down, know that your mind is part of the cosmic mind. It's eternal. It's, in, it's involatile. That I think for Epictetus he recognized that mind, to have a mind, is to have a little portion of the divine mind. And that is this total absolute freedom. And the more that you just focus on that freedom, the more that you are, for him, likened to the gods, likened to the, uh, the highest mind. Right? Um, and so again, I think it's so important to get this sort of social politeness issue that Epictetus is described as having. Uh, a, a good will and a care toward others, especially those who weren't, quotes, as enlightened as he was. Uh, he, he wasn't suggesting that you need to, you know, take the death of, of, of some loved one as, you know, when you see a neighbor grieving over the death of a loved one, you don't take this as an opportunity to, 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 to show them that it's really just their thought, not the event. You know, I don't think that's, that's so uh, really anti-Epictetus. Anti I think for him it is about recognizing the human plight of the struggle, right? This is why in some of the earlier passages, I think we talked about this issue in number five, right? To accuse others for one's misfortune is a sign of want of education. To accuse oneself shows that one's education has begun. To accuse neither oneself nor others shows that one's education is complete. But I think that's why he's going with that. Okay, I want to do 19 here and sort of try to follow up on that. He says here, you can be invincible 
if you never enter a contest where victory is not in your power. Beware then that when you see a man raised to honor or great power or high repute, you do not let your impression carry you away. For if the reality of good lies in what is in our power, there is no room for envy or jealousy, and you will not wish to be creator or prefect or counsel, but to be free, and there is but one way to freedom, to despise what is not in our power. Yeah, there's so much wonderful stuff here in Epictetus and in the ancient world on the woes and troubles that would come to those who would take counsel into the the emperor or the rulers at the time, the you know the huge Roman bureaucracies, uh, where to be involved as a creator or as a prefect or in, in the council to be an advisor, to be invited into various councils and discussions, these would be great honors and but they would also be sources of great stress for people because to I think these are early discussions of what it means to live life in public and all of the woes that come from being misunderstood from if you're going to step into the light and be sort of, I guess, made visible from just the anonymous crowd that's out there, you're now going to be subject to perhaps, what is this, honor or power or repute. But first off, your station or office in life is something that's really outside of your control. You could try to say it is. You could try to say that you're a self-made person and you got what you deserve because you worked hard for it. But no, other people have worked just as hard or harder, but they got hit by a bus. You know, you've had the good fortune of you had a particular application to a particular person who knew a person, and so it went. Uh, some other person, again, w w the the day that they you were about to get the job, the person who was going to hire you got hit by a bus. You know, I mean, there's so many things that are outside of our control, and to realize that all of these things are outside of our control, and for Epictetus, what you do is you celebrate your freedom, which is to just despise whatever is outside of your control. Now, it's very important. He's not suggesting avoid all office, although I think some of it, you know, it comes off that way. If you, if you read the text, he himself sort of avoided these kinds of things, but he didn't admonish that people should avoid him. He himself chose not to. He chose not to be involved in, in politics of the day. Uh, I think... Part of the question is, can one strive to do good, actively struggle to do good with no expectation, with literally no expectation? I think the more that one can say, I'm only going to focus what's on my control and I'm not going to worry at all about anything that's not under my control. Uh, I think I may have talked about this in another video, but it's just one little entry. It's number 27. As a mark is not set up for men to miss it, so there's nothing intrinsically evil in the world. Yeah, this is so much the intentionalist ethics philosophy is just stated right there. Setting up ethical aims, you know, setting up a target, setting some goal, that is a good aiming as best you can, striving for it, training as best you can if you're an athlete. That All those, those are good. But whether the arrow ultimately hits or misses the target, not a good, not an evil. Uh, those are things that are ultimately outside your control. You could have the perfect aim, the perfect shot, but, I don't know, the wind blows, somebody could cheat, whatever could happen, it's outside of your control. I think... So many of us, we end up aligning with the the hit or the miss rather than the, the intention. The intention. Um, okay, so those are a couple more entries there, things to think about on Epictetus. Okay, hope everyone is continuing to read. And please, if you're shooting videos, get those videos up here. Uh, we still have, I guess, about half of December left. I'm going to continue to talk about Epictetus throughout December. And then we're going to move on to Morris Berman in January. We're going to look at that wonderful little chapter called uh, The Basic Fault from his book, Coming to Our Senses. Okay, thanks.